How is it that war in Europe should threaten people in Africa and the Middle East with starvation? Food sovereignty was once a core demand of liberation movements everywhere. The present dependence of many countries in Africa and Asia on imported grains is an indication of just how far their anti-colonial struggles for freedom and independence have been rolled back by the neo-colonial New World Order, with the World Trade Organization, the WTO, and the International Monetary Fund, IMF, as the primary instruments of modern day enslavement. This article is reproduced from Indian Marxist journal, People's Democracy, with thanks. Russia and Ukraine together account for 30% of the world's wheat exports. Many African countries, in particular, are heavily dependent on them for the food supplies, which are now getting disrupted because of the war. And this disruption would continue since the war is also affecting the acreage being sown under food grains there. Ukraine alone accounts for about 20% of the world's maize exports, which again are under threat, endangering food availability in several vulnerable countries. Besides, Russia is the source of fertiliser supplies for a number of countries and the disruption in fertiliser imports from Russia will have a further escalating effect on world food prices and reduce food availability. Compared to what it had been in the month of February before the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, the price of staple food grains had increased by 17% by, eight, by the 8th of April, making millions more people vulnerable to famine. These numbers can only increase in the coming days. The countries most vulnerable are in West Asia and in Africa, especially countries like Yemen, Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Afghanistan. Experts have been warning of this possibility for some time, but while there is much concern over the loss of lives in the actual theatre of war, the far greater loss of lives that the decline in food availability threatens in countries far away from the theatre of war has scarcely drawn the attention of the world at large, especially the Western world. In all this discussion, however, a central question has not been asked. Why have some countries in the world become so vulnerable to famines that any disruption in food supplies anywhere immediately threatens them with massive loss of lives? Why, in short, do we have famine-vulnerable countries at all? The immediate answer to this question would be that these are countries that have themselves been afflicted by war. Whether it is Afghanistan, Sudan, or the Horn of Africa, there has been a history of wars, stretching even up to the present, and their vulnerability to famines arises from the disruptions affected by this history. This explanation, however, simply would not do. Wars in this context obviously must include internal insurgency, or what is commonly called terrorism. But this raises two questions. First, insurgency itself cannot be assumed to be an externally given phenomenon. It is so rooted in and related to the phenomenon of poverty and food non-availability that it cannot provide an independent explanation for the latter. And second, wars in this most comprehensive sense, incorporating insurgency as well, characterise virtually the whole of the third world. Why then are only some countries considered vulnerable and not others? The real answer to the question why some countries are considered vulnerable, not others, 
lies in the fact that these countries have sacrificed their food sovereignty to the demands of imperialism. After decolonization, most countries in the third world, which had witnessed steep declines in their per capita food grain output and availability during the colonial period, a phenomenon that had been underlain recurrent famines in the colonial era, sought to increase the domestic production of food grains. It was considered an essential counterpart of decolonization, and rightly so, to build up domestic food grain production and availability. This, however, was resisted by imperialism, which on the basis of an entirely spurious argument based on comparative advantage, not only advised third world countries to abandon the quest for food self-sufficiency, but incorporated this demand into the WTO agenda, that land use should be determined by market signals rather than any goal of achieving food self-sufficiency. Now the advanced capitalist countries have a permanent surplus of certain grains. While they simply cannot grow or grow in adequate quantities or the entire year round, a whole range of tropical or subtropical crops such as fresh vegetables, fruit, fibres, sugar, crops, oil crops, beverages and spices. Altering the pattern of land use in the third world, which is roughly coterminous with the tropical and subtropical parts of the world, therefore is doubly advantageous for the advanced capitalist countries. First, by forcing the third world to import food grains, it enables the metropolis to get rid of its surplus food grains. And second, the third world land devoted earlier to food grain production is now released for producing other crops namely those that are demanded by the metropolis, which would now also include crops that are earmarked for biofuel production. Africa acceded to the imperialist demand more quickly than any other part of the third world, and not surprisingly, the list of vulnerable countries is replete with African examples. Let us just take two examples from among those that figure in the above-mentioned list. Nigeria, which is by far the largest country in Africa, in terms of population, was more than 200 million people, and Kenya, which not too long ago was being held by the OECD as a success story of liberation. According to the statistics provided by the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, the gross per capita cereal output index for Nigeria from 2014 to 2016 is equals 100 was 129.37 in 1990. It fell to 101.09 in 2019, a drop in excess of 20% in the course of just three decades. In Kenya, the gross per capita cereal output index from 2014 to 2016 equals 100, showed a similar drop of close to 20% over the same period from 132.82 in 1990 to 107.97 in 2019. If we go back to 1980 in the case of Kenya, then the drop is even more precipitous, from 155.96 to 107.97. This is by more than 30% in the course of just four decades. It is this phenomenal drop in domestic food grain output resulting in substantial reliance on imports that makes countries vulnerable to famines. This also shows clearly why all this talk of comparative advantage is completely bogus. The concept of comparative advantage, of course, is conceptually flawed. When one of the countries simply cannot produce one of the commodities, as was with the case with colonial trade, comparative advantage cannot be defined at all. Put differently, trade according to comparative advantage, i.e. according to the notion that a country should export what it produces relatively cheaply and import what it does not, presumes that all countries produce all commodities before trade. In addition, when comparative advantage flows from relative factor endowments that are themselves alterable through capital accumulation, for instance, then trade according to comparative advantage 
prevents such alterations and therefore freezes the production pattern to the detriment of the capital poor and labour abundant country that is poor countries are prevented from investing in high technology industries or even industrialising at all but even if we ignore these basic objections to comparative advantage and proceed on the assumptions made by the very advocates of this theory even then following comparative advantage and becoming import dependent for a crucial commodity like food grains is suicidal for a country a whole range of unforeseen developments in the world over which a country has absolutely no control can expose its people to famines the simple truth was understood by the anti-colonial struggles everywhere they took it for granted very rightly that independence meant being food self-sufficient at least at a certain minimum level of consumption not necessarily within each country but at least among a group of third world countries constituting a food community and strove towards it africa however was coerced by imperialism into abandoning this goal and is alas paying the price for it today with the threat of famine looming over it india notwithstanding its early post-colonial plan for raising domestic food production of which the grow more food campaign was an expression got trapped into buying american food under the pl 480 scheme it is only after the acute droughts of the mid-1960s that the importance of being food sovereign dawned on our ruling governments and the green revolution no matter what its other lacuna was launched to achieve this target imperialist efforts to undo india's food sovereignty have been relentless since then and imperialism found a sucker in the modi government which passed agrarian legislation to withdraw the minimum support price regime that constitutes the linchpin behind india's food sovereignty the heroic kasan agitation however has saved the day and the government was forced to withdraw the three farm laws food sovereignty continues for the time being but the people must remain unremittingly vigilant if it is to be preserved Thanks for listening to Proletarian Radio. We aim to bring you the best Marxist analysis on current affairs, revolutionary history, and theory. Do like, comment, subscribe, and share our content to help us reach the widest possible audience. We are a small organization with limited resources, and we need workers' support if we are to grow and fulfill our mission. If you are able to make a one off or regular donation, no matter how small, please visit our website at thecommunists.org and register as a supporter.